it's time for the next session. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to PC301. And this is the third day of the workshop, and we are ready with our second talk for the day. And we have with us Professor Peter Fomin from University of Bergen, and he'll be taking the second lecture on uh, TreeWit. And today he's discussing TreeWit applications. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us. Over to you now. Hello. This is uh, the continuation of uh, Trivit's lectures. And uh, what we learned yesterday about Trivit's that the most important message was that many problems which are intractable in general graphs are fixed parameter tractable, parameterized by the Trivit's of a graph. So what we will learn today is if we apply what we learned yesterday, plus abstractions to small trivets, will imply more interesting algorithmic results. So the reminder, so just to be sure that we remember what is a tree decomposition. So tree decomposition of a graph is a pair where is a pair T and he, where T is a tree and he is assigned to every node T of T, a vertex subset X of T. And this uh, tree decomposition, it satisfies three properties. The first property is that every vertex should be in some back. The second, that every H should be in some back. And the third, the separation property that uh, if I take uh, backs which contain any node, uh, for any node, if I can take all bags containing it, that these bags will form a subtree in the tree T. And then the width of a tree decomposition is the maximum size of a bag, and then the tree width of a graph is the minimum taken over all tree decompositions. Yes, so all lecture today will be spent on the discussion what makes tree widths large, and as far as we understand it, that will be very useful for algorithms. Okay, so what makes the trivial sludge? So first of all, if uh, just my graph is a click on K vertices, what will be the trivial of this graph? Well, if you start uh, trying to make the composition of this graph, you will soon uh, will see that actually, if you have a complete graph, then all vertices, uh, there always should be a back in any tree decomposition such that all vertices should live there. And why uh, this is so? Because if, uh, if uh, there's no a back which contains all vertices of the complete graph, then uh, you will enter very easily with contradiction so the, so you will enter in contradiction with the third property of three decompositions and the, the second also. So every H should be in the back, right? And then uh, so by connectivity property will uh, uh, get into contradiction to that. So, so if you don't know how to prove this, it's a nice trick to play with that and to, to show that the trivets of a complete graph is always K, on K vertices is always K minus one. But, uh, but is it always like that? So what I mean by always like that? So if I have a, so if I have a large click in a graph, then the trivets should be large. But is it always like that? So if I have a graph of large trivets, does it always should contain a large click as a subgraph? Apparently not, right? And the next example is uh, the example of a grid. So if I take a K times K grid, so this is a planar graph. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, so uh, here is an example of four times four grid on this figure. Uh, so it's also possible to show that the trivial of K times K grid is K. So it's e quite easy to show that uh, the trivets is at most K, right? Because uh, how your decomposition will look like, you take the first column of uh, the grid as the first back, then you remove one vertex from this uh, back, 
and add one vertex from the second column. And uh, doing this interchange uh, changes, you will go from one column to the second column, and then you go from the second column to the third column. So that will be a 3D composition. It's more tricky to prove that uh, the uh, trivets of a grid is exactly key. So here you need uh, some deeper ideas about tangles, uh, but just uh, for this talk, just uh, believe me that actually uh, planar grid uh, or K time K, sorry, so that the trivets of the K times K grid is exactly K. And this k times k grid is definitely it's a planar graph, right? And uh, and actually, so and actually, uh, uh, so you can see uh, that uh, this grid it doesn't contain even a clique of size three, right? As a subgraph. And if you start maybe contract ages and uh, doing something, you you will still you will be having a planar graph. So it doesn't look like uh, this uh, graph will have a large clique, right? So. Okay, so 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 definitely. Uh, so our first uh, idea that uh, okay, if if I have a large trivets, then there should be always be a click. Is not correct, but surprisingly, so the uh, the second thing or the second example. So if I have a large uh, trivets, then there should be a large grid in this graph. Is correct. But to formulate this uh, more precisely, I need the notion, what do I mean by large grid living inside, right? So for that, I need a definition of graph minor. Okay, so the first observation is that the trivets of a graph, it doesn't increase if we delete ages, right? Why? Because if I just uh, have a one graph, I have a 3D composition of that graph, and I have another graph, I just delete one age from the first graph, I just take exactly the same 3D composition. And this, this also will be the 3D composition of the second graph. So it doesn't, so deleting of an age doesn't decrease, doesn't increase the trivets. The same if I delete a, a vertex from a graph, I just take the composition of 3D composition of the first graph and I just uh, const and, I, and, and, then, and I construct a 3D composition of the second graph just taking the same decomposition and just removing from all bugs the vertex which I deleted from the first graph. So it's also, so uh, this way I can only decrease three, three, the trivets of a graph. Yes, so the definition of a graph minor is important here. So graph minor is a, uh, graph H is a minor of graph G. So if graph H can be obtained from G by deleting ages, deleting vertices, and contracting ages. By contracting ages, I mean the following operation. So if I have two adjacent vertices, U and V, then contracting H, U, V is the operation. I just delete H, U, V, and I identify the vertices U and V, and I call the, the new vertex W. So on, on this example, is a, this graph is obtained by contracting H, U. And then the deleting here, the HUV is here. <laughs> yes, so for example, so if uh, tri tri triangle, so a graph on three vertices, the cycle on three vertices is a minor of a graph if and only if, for example, this graph is has a cycle, so it's not a forest, right? Because every, uh, so, so why it's so, right? Because if I have a cycle in a graph, I can always uh, contract uh, all but three edges of the cycle to obtain a triangle and then to delete all uh, remaining edges and vertices. So that will be the... Okay. And the uh, equivalent way of thinking about minus uh, Oh, yes, uh, just a second, okay. So, um, just uh, let's stay at this definition a second longer. So we say that graph H can be obtained from G by deleting ages, deleting vertices and contracting ages. So the question here is, is it important in which ordering we delete ages, delete vertices, 
would it be the same operation? Uh, so if we say we first delete ages and then we contract ages, or if first we delete one age, we contract one age, right? Just uh, it's an interesting question to think, right? So just to, to try to prove that the order here is that, that doesn't matter. So in, in, in so if graph H is a minor of graph G, which obtained by a sequence of this uh, graph editing operations, it doesn't matter in which ordering you allow to take this operation. So it's it will does the same. An equivalent definition of a graph minor could be, or the, the another perspective of what, what is a minor. So it's in terms of mapping. So graph G is a minor, graph H is a minor of graph G. If there exists a mapping that match map every vertex of H to a connected subset of a graph G. And it satisfies the following properties. So this, uh, the images of vertices U and V are disjoint if these are different vertices. And if H, if, uh, if uh, U and V are adjacent in the graph G, then there should be an H phi, uh, between the images of U and the images of V. So in this example, I have a graph, right? Which is a minor of this graph. And here are the images of, uh, so for example, uh, so the vertex one is mapped only to one vertex. The vertex two is also mapped to, two, uh, to, to, to one vertex. But uh, the vertex four, for example, is mapped to four vertices. And the vertex six is mapped to three vertices. And uh, why this is uh, the same definition, right? So to see that, that uh, look, so the, the black vertices, the vertices which are not images of any vertex of a graph H, you can just delete them, right? So then uh, the, um, the image of one vertex, because it's connected component, you just contract it into one vertex, right? And then, uh, so th so th then, uh, and this way you will construct uh, the graph A, uh, the graph H, uh, as a matter. So these two definitions, uh, as, as a minor. So these two definitions are really equivalent. So the fact which I, I will be using. There's a question. Yes. yes. Sure. So in the second bullet. UV is a pH. Yeah. Uh, so UV should belong to EH. Or is it EG only? No, no. If 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 I have two vertices which are adjacent, mm -hmm. then there should be at least one H between the images. So for example, vertex six and vertex four. Uh, adjacent here, right? Ah, you're right. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. You're right. So if, uh, yeah, yeah. So here should be an H, of course. Okay. That was the question, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank that's you. A, that, that, that's a typo. Here should be H. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the. The fact which I will be using a lot is that uh, the trivets is closed under operations of uh, age deletion, vertex deletion, and age contraction. So in other words, so that uh, trivets doesn't increase when we delete ages, delete vertices, and contract ages. Right? So I already well uh, uh, give some uh, hints why the trivets doesn't increase when we delete ages and vertices. And uh, why the trivets doesn't increase when we contract ages, right? That's again. So we have to take a look what happening with the tri. So basically, again. So if I have a H U V, and I have a three decomposition of a graph G, so then when I contract this H, I just take uh, the same three decomposition, right? And everywhere I just replace where uh, U or a V occurs, I replace it by the occurrence of the new vertex W. And then I have to check that all three, uh, hypo, uh, all three uh, axioms of the trivets hold. But, yeah. 
Okay, but then so if uh, we accept this fact that the trivis is closed under H deletion, H vertex removal, and uh, H contraction, then if I have a graph H, which is a minor of graph G, then the trivets of graph H should be at most the trivets of graph G. And for example, so uh, we already proved that if uh, that the trivets of a complete graph K uh, on K plus one vertices is at most is is exactly K, right? So then uh, if a graph G contains uh, such a graph as a minor, so then the trivets of a graph is also at least K. Uh, yes, so this is a... Uh, uh, yes, and then uh, again, so the same question. So if the trivets of a graph is large, does it always contain a large clique as a minor? And the answer again is no, right? Because uh, if I take a grid, the grid doesn't contain a large clique as a minor, right? Why? Because grid is a planar graph, right? And if I delete H, delete vertex or a contract on H, my graph still will be a planar, right? But uh, any planar graph, it cannot contain a clique on five vertices as a minor, right? This is the famous uh, Kuratowski theorem. So it means that uh, the condition that uh, 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 just the that the condition that the, or the, that the statement that uh, if my trivets is large, then there should be a clique minor there. It's not true at all, right? Uh, uh, and of course, again, we know that already uh, what is the trivets of a, of a grid. So then if a graph contains large grid as a minor, then its trivets is also large. What is really surprising, and um, uh, there are some, um, uh, uh, it's not magic, of course, it's, it's just uh, only math, but still there are some small miracle here that uh, actually uh, the opposite is true, that if graph contains, okay, sorry, uh, yes, so, so we know that if graph contains large grid as a minor, then the trivis is large, but what is really surprising uh, and uh, ma uh, mysterious, uh, ma not mysterious, it's uh, also amazing or exciting here, is that the converse is also true, that if a graph, uh, uh, that every graph of large trivets should contain a large grid as a minor. This is a very famous result of Neil Robertson and Paul Seymour in graph minus. And this is a very important result. It was first of all also used in graph theory. But then uh, in, uh, Robertson and Seymour also started to uh, show how to use this uh, to solve, uh, uh, to obtain a polynomial time algorithm for the disjoint path problem. And uh, the disjoint, uh, this algorithm, it really exploiting uh, this. Uh, uh, this type of duality, what is the large tree between large trivets and uh, the uh, large grid minor. And after that, uh, people really start to use it and uh, in a very creative way. And there are a lot of different applications of this duality theorem. Also, there were a lot of efforts to obtain uh, the best uh, bound because uh, so uh, the way I state this result, I say if the trivets is large, it's there should be a large grid. What what does it mean large, right? So if you go to the numbers, so the result of Robertson and Seymour was saying that, that if the trivets of the graph is at least some constant g, then it should contains some uh, 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 there was a like a two to the two to the power g grid times two to the two to the two power g grid as a minor. So there was a super exponential size of the grid, and people spent a lot of time uh, on uh, trying to improve uh, the, 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 this combinatorial bounds. And there was a real breakthrough of uh, Chikuri and Chujoi. So who proved that actually uh, this exchange of the trivets and the size of the grid is polynomial. And then, uh, so the best uh, so far result is uh, on, on the size of the grid minor is the result of Yulia Chujoi and Zihan Tan. So they obtained that, uh, so that's uh, the paper. And here is something like, uh, if the, my graph uh, is of trivets G, then this graph should contains G power six 
times g power six time greater. Greek, as I know. So sorry, once again, so what's Robertson is saying, right? The Robertson and same are saying, if I have a large trivets, I have a large grid. Uh, sorry, just, just a sec. My computer trying to install some things right now and I'm trying to fight against it. So just, just, okay. Okay, I think I won. Okay, well, once again. So, 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 sorry, I'm just uh, taken back. So, um, what what Robertson and Seymour show? They show that if I have a large trivets, I have a large grid. And then, what means large trivets? So, if my the size of my trivets is very large, so it's like two to the two to the uh, t, two to the two to the g, so some constant g. Then I have a g times g grid as a minor. Right, and uh, what Chukuri and Chujoy did, they reduced this, this bound on trivets to polynomial. And finally, the, the now the best current bound is that if the trivets is at least g power six, then I have a g times g grid as a minor. And uh, this is already comes to quite close because there are also lower bound, which is like almost quadratic. But uh, for, for this lecture, I will be using another grid theorem because uh, so the grid theorem for planar graphs. And the grid theorem for planar graphs is uh, quite, tight, quite tight up to a constant. So this, uh, the, the planar grid theorem says that, uh, so for any integer t, if my planar graph has, is of trivets at least nine over two t, then this graph should contains t times t grid as a minor. Right, so here, so in a, for general graphs, it's a, the difference is up to polynomial, right, between trivets and the size of the grid. But for planar graphs, it's a, it's linear dependence. And, uh, and actually, so there is also algorithm which construct the 3 decomposition of the corresponding width. Okay, so how this theorem is proved? Uh, uh, so uh, as in many uh, theorems of this type, so the, the proof is based on uh, the classical Menge theorem. So, and the Menge theorem is just the, the theorem about the duality of the size of the separator and the number of disjoint paths between two vertices. So if I have a finite direct graphs and I have two non-adjacent vertices x and y in this graph g, then uh, the Menger theorem says that the size of the minimum vertex card, so then the minimum number of vertices which removal leaves x and y in different components is equal to the maximum number of pairwise vertex disjoint paths from x and y. So this is the theorem I will be using to prove the Planar grid theorem. What's happening? Okay, so I just take a planar graph and uh, I assume that this planar graph, that's my assumption, doesn't contain L times L grid as a minor. I want to show that the trivets of this graph should be at most some constant C times L, right? This is what my planar grid theorem. So what I do, I embed my planar graph on a plane Right, and I put it actually. I also uh, I take the outer face and I make uh, a square out of outer face. And why I make make a square is just uh, more convenient than for me to to call this the side west, north, east, and south sides of the square. Now, so if I cannot uh, separate east from west. And if I cannot separate south from north by removing at most L vertices, then by Menger theorem, there are L vertex disjoint paths from south to north. And also there are at least L disjoint paths from east to the west, right? So uh, in this case, if I have a uh, L disjoint paths going from left to right and from top to bottom, I just, the intersection of this paths create L times L grid. And uh, 
or if uh, there is a separator, right? I just can take this separator and I, I just take this, uh, the vertices of the separator as a back of a 3D composition. And then I start to construct recursively 3D compositions of uh, subgraphs which I, uh, or, or of the connected component, which I obtained after, remov after removing this L vertices. So this, this uh, I proceed recursively. And then at the end, I would either construct a decomposition of trivets at most L, and this will contradict to my assumption that uh, the trivets of the graph is uh, larger than L. No, no, either I will construct a 3D composition of bits at most A, right? Or I will construct a, a grid of size times A times A. Okay, and here, uh, so, so this is the idea of the proof, but uh, the way I explain you this proof, it's not entirely, it's not entirely, uh, it, it's a, uh, I would say, okay, let's say, uh, be honest, it's not entirely correct. And why it's not entirely correct? So I was, uh, so the, 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 the thing which I really skip in this proof is uh, quite messy part because I was saying, okay, if uh, there's no separator, then there are disjoint paths from left to right and there are disjoint paths from top, from top to, to bottom, right? And then I was saying that the intersection of these paths creates a minor of a grid. Well, this is correct, but uh, the way to prove it, so if you see in the picture, it's more or less clear here, right? Because, but, uh, but uh, on this picture, I, I, I lie to you because uh, the way this, so the Menger theorem, it doesn't say how this path looks like, right? And this path, they go back and forth many times and they can behave in a very ugly way. And then basically when you take the intersection of this uh, very ugly paths, you really have to, you, you, you'll struggle to prove that uh, the intersection of this path will contain a large grid as a minor. This is still true, but you have to be very careful and this is not a trivial part of the proof. So just be aware that, well, yes, what, what I say is correct, but uh, there are a lot of things which I don't explain and it's not that simple as it looks like. But the intuition is uh, correct. Okay, so the immediate application of uh, these things, I want to give you a sub-exponential parameterized algorithm for vertex cover. So vertex cover of a graph, this is the problem. Uh, if you follow the lectures of this uh, course, you met a lot of time, right? Because uh, when, uh, when anyone was given the example of branching algorithm, you start from vertex scala. When anyone was given your canalization algorithm, you start from vertex scala, and then you continue with vertex scala all the time, right? Still, so for, for those of you who missed all these lectures, this is the definition of the vertex scala. So given a graph, an integer k, I want to decide whether g contains a vertex scala of size at most k. And what we saw, so that we, we, we uh, we saw not one, but we saw a lot of algorithms for vertex cover, which solved vertex cover in time to two to the K, right? Because uh, branching algorithm solves vertex cover in time two to the K. And uh, if you do kernelization and then you do broad force after that, you solve the vertex cover in two to the K. And actually, even I gave you the last lecture, the algorithm for vertex cover. I was giving you algorithm for independent end. Right, but uh, what is the independent set? If I have an independent set and I take all vertices which are not in the independent set, it's a vertex cover, right? So every time when I compute a maximum independent set, I always compute the minimum vertex cover. So, and my algorithm of yesterday was computing the maximum independent set in times two to the trivets of the graph, right? So, uh, and from this algorithm, you immediately obtain the algorithm which computes a vertex cover in time two to the trivets of the graph, right? And by the way, uh, this uh, algorithm two to the trivets uh, uh, for vertex cover, it also implies the algorithms uh, two to the K for vertex cover, right? So if, uh, if, you, if you don't know this, try to prove that uh, trivets is always at most vertex cover, right? That's uh, that could be another exercise. 
Okay, so we have an algorithm which works for vertex cover in two to the k for general graphs, and also this is uh, more or less what to, we can obtain because after exponential time hypothesis, you cannot go beyond uh, linear function of k in the in this with this running time. But for planar graphs, the situation is different, and for planar graphs, uh, I will show you algorithm which solves vertex cover in times two to the square root of k. Again, so nothing uh, uh, really terrible happening here, right? Because yes, we solve a problem which is NP complete. We solve it uh, on, on in sub-exponential time and uh, on planar graphs. And on planar graphs, vertex cover is still uh, NP complete, but nothing uh, bad happening here. It doesn't show that P is equal to NP, right? Because it's still uh, the the class of problems which are solvable in sub-exponential. Uh, Time is still not polynomial running time, right? It's still exponential. So, so from the perspective of p and np, nothing bad happening. But still, this uh, two to the square root of k of exponential parameterized running time, it's a quite huge improvement to the two to the comparing to the running time of the vertex cover for vertex cover on general graphs. So, I want to prove uh, the following theorem. So. So this sub exponential time algorithm, it will follow from completely combinatorial result. So if a graph G contains a vertex cover of size K, this is what I want to prove, then the trivial of this graph is at most square root of K up to some constant. Okay. So if we prove this, then we, immediately we'll have the algorithm, right, uh, of running time two to the square root of k, which solves uh, vertex cover on planar graph. Why? Right, why? Because of the previous slide, right? Because we know how to solve the problem in uh, two to the trivets. So if the trivets is at most square root of k, then we solve, then I just take the trivets algorithm and I solve this problem in some exponential running time. Okay, so how I prove this theorem? Few questions to ask. First of all, let's stare at a grid. So how large could be the vertex cover of a T times T grid? Well, it could be a quite large, right? Because the so T times T grid, it contains a, a matching of size roughly T square over two. Right, you you just take every every so all all in every row you take odd edges of the rows, right, and that will be the matching of this size. And uh, this means that uh, so for every edge of this matching, you need at least one vertex to cover it, right? So this means that uh, if you have t times t grid, then you the, the vertex cover of this uh, t times t grid is at least t square over two. This is one observation. And the second is the vertex cover minor closed. What do I mean by that? So if I have a graph with vertex cover at most k, if I take a minor of this graph, then the vertex cover of the minor will be also at most k. And why this is? Well, uh, you, we have to just check that, uh, the, that the vertex cover of a graph doesn't increase when we delete h. And this is true, right? So if I have a set of vertices which cover edges, if I delete an h, I still cover all edges of the graph. We also have to show that uh, the vertex cover is closed under when I delete a vertex, right? And again, so if I delete a vertex, if I have already vertex cover in a graph, if I delete a vertex in a graph, if this vertex doesn't belong to vertex cover, I'm fine, right? Uh, uh, so I still cover all edges of the graph. And if I delete a vertex which belongs to vertex cover, right? When I delete a vertex, I also delete all edges incident to this vertex. So I don't need this vertex to cover anymore, right? So I'm still perfectly fine. So I don't increase the vertex cover. The more uh, tricky to show that uh, uh, if I contract an edge, then the vertex cover also doesn't increase. But again, this is also, it's, 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 uh, 
it, it's, it, well, it's more complicated than age deletion, but it's not that complicated. So here, just below. So vertex cover is minor closed. Yes. That's it. Actually, we don't need anything else. As far as we know the planar grid theorem, these two observations implies that if a planar graph G contains a vertex cover of size K, then the trivial of this graph should be also, should is at most square root of K. How come? Indeed. So if I have, a, if the trivial of my graph is more than C square root of K, where C is some constant, I don't want to specify this constant, you just take a look at the planar grid theorem and take the constant from there. Then this uh, graph G should contain uh, square root of K times square root of K grid as a minor, right? This is a planar grid theorem. But now, uh, because uh, it's a grid, I'm using property one, I know that this grid should have vertex cover of size at least k. Correct? Then, because uh, this grid is a minor of a graph G, the vertex cover of a graph G is at least the vertex cover of this grid minor, which is k. So this means that the G has no vertex cover of size k. Yes. So as far as we have a planar grid theorem, this theorem becomes very easy. And definitely there are ways of uh, now we have other tools to prove this theorem with other uh, tools, but just try to do it uh, without planar grid theorem. You have a chance to succeed, but uh, that will be much more painful, believe me. Yes, but, uh, but also uh, it's quite important to when uh, you have uh, some uh, combinatorial or, or algorithmic results, just to, uh, to try to analyze uh, what, uh, what exactly you prove or what kind of properties of the problem or of a graph class you really use for that. So for example, was it, uh, so was this type of uh, result which we prove was it uh, really special for vertex cover? So for example, can we use exactly the same results to show that if my graph has a feedback with a set of size at most k, then the trivets of this graph is square root of k. Or if a planar graph has a dominating set of size k, then the trivets of graph G is an also square root of k. And if we try to analyze what we really did, right? So the only thing what we did we, we look at how vertex cover behave, behave on a grid. And again, so it's, uh, the grid is a very simple object. We can, try, we can analyze a lot of problems there. So if I have a grid, then feedback vertex set on this grid should be very large again, right? Should be of order uh, of the quadratic uh, order of the, also should be of the order of, of, of the size of the grid. Or, uh, and, or if I take the dominating set, it also should be large in the grid. And many other problems should be large on the grid. Then can I obtain this, the same type of combinatorial result for these problems? And can I uh, use these combinatorial results uh, to obtain some exponential time algorithms for all these problems? And also, so that was for problems where I want to uh, minimize or, or, or parameterize problems where I ask if there's a subset of vertices or edges of size at most key. But there are also a lot of interesting problems where I'm asking if there is something of size at least key. So for example, if I have a path of length at least k, right? And again, so if the trivial of a planar graph is more than c times square root of k, then uh, graph G should contains a path on K vertices. That's exactly the same argument, right? So if I have a square root of time K, square root of time K grid, then in this grid, I can always construct a path of length K, right? I just traverse column by column and I traverse all vertices. So it will be even Hamiltonian path. Uh, or if I have a, uh, independent set of size k, sorry, or if I have a trivial of size uh, again square root of k, then my graph also should have an independent set 
of size k, right? Again, that's the grid arguments. I have a grid, and in this, if I have square root of k times square root of time, k times grid, then in this grid, I have an order of k independent set. But the same, uh, look, we have a lot of different problems, but the arguments I'm using are quite the same, right? I just take a grid, I look what's happening on the grid, and then I obtain the bound on the trivets, and then I'm using trivets algorithms. And this gives uh, me the quite generic algorithm. And with this uh, generic algorithm, I can solve a lot of pra parameterized problems on planar graphs in sub-exponential parameterized time. So what is my algorithm? So I have some parameter k, right, which comes with the problem. Usually it's the size of the set I want to compute. Then I just compute the trivets of the graph. And if the trivets is at least uh, c square root of k, for some constant c, which depends on the problem, uh, I say immediately no, right, for minimization problem. Why? Because well, why is this correct? Because if the trivial uh, is uh, larger than this uh, c squared of k, then I have a large grid, and in the large grid I cannot construct the required set. So and uh, yeah, so I say no. And uh, for maximization problems, it's opposite, right? So if I have a large grid, then I always can find a solution in this grid, and then uh, to, to take uh, my minor properties. To, to transform the solution into the original graph. And if the trivial is uh, at most uh, this c squared of k, then I just do dynamic programming, which we discussed in the first lecture. Right? So, yeah. So this is, uh, and uh, so the only, the, the, the only thing which you have to check is how your problem behaves on a grid. Then you also should uh, check if your problem is minor close, right? Because minor close property is important. Or if your property is not minor close, there is a, a weaker condition, which is called contraction close. For that, you can also to try uh, to do something uh, similar. And uh, then you just apply the dynamic programming techniques, which we learned yesterday. That's it. And uh, this type of uh, ideas, uh, so what do we learn, right? So if I have a small trivial, I can do dynamic programming. If I have a large trivial, it's, uh, well, I cannot do dynamic programming, but I know that uh, I have a large grid as a minor. And this is also very useful because then I can easily say yes, no. And there are much more advanced techniques. Uh, for example, if you have a large grid as a minor, you can always, for some problems, you can conclude that actually, uh, then you can always find an irrelevant vertex, uh, which means that the vertex, after removal of this irrelevant vertex, nothing changes in your problem. So if you have yes instance, that still will be yes instance. If you, if you have no instance, it still will be a no instance. This is a more complicated technique, but it's still, it's based on exactly the same ideas. Either trivial is small or you have a structure and then you can do something with this structure. And actually on a very general level, it's also, this is the way how Robertson and Seymour algorithm for this joint path works because what this algorithm is doing, either the trivial of the graph is small, you do dynamic programming. If the trivial of the graph is large, then you can prove that you have a relevant vertex such that if you remove this vertex, nothing, can, nothing will be, so the, the, you will have exactly the same, uh, you will have an equivalent instance of the problem. So then what you're doing, you just uh, compute trivial, uh, uh, the trivial is small, do dynamic programming, the trivial is large, you, 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 you find a relevant vertex, you remove this relevant vertex, and again, so you reduce the size of your problem, so you continue again and again. And again, there are a lot of this type of algorithms which explore the relevant vertex technique. The arguments which I was explaining for vertex cover, this uh, trick, uh, dynamic programming, grid, and sub-exponential algorithms, it's actually, there is a systematic way of uh, explaining what kind of problems uh, have this uh, pr property. And this um, brings to bidimensionality theory. So this bidimensionality theory is the theory on, about how just the, 
how to obtain some exponential algorithms on planar graphs. And again, if you go deeper into this topic, so there is nothing special in planar graphs because the only property of planarity we, we use, we never use the property that uh, my graph should be embeddable on a plane. So the only thing we use, uh, the property we use that, uh, that if I have a large trivets, then this, there should be a large grid, right? Uh, or the grid of size linear in, in trivets. And uh, as far as you have a class of graphs which satisfies this property. And for example, if you embed your graph not on a plane, but on a surface of bounded genus, this is again, so the same property. And also it's possible to prove even for much more general classes of graphs, that the graphs which exclude some graph as a minor, H minor free graphs, they also have a linear uh, trivets grid dependence. And uh, for these graphs, again, you can have the same type of sub exponential algorithms, the same type arguments, the same arguments just go through, right? Because uh, the, you, you don't need polarity. And the same things goes for uh, with additional tricks. You can do it for different classes of geometric graphs or for map graphs. So again, so this is a quite general things and it's not really about polarity. It's about only about the trivials and the grids. Also this, uh, this grid type of arguments, they, uh, find applications in approximation algorithms. So there is a quite general uh, theorems uh, how to obtain uh, polynomial time approximation schemes for many problems on planar graphs or H minor free, uh, H minor free graphs by making use of, again, by dimensionality of the problems. And again, at the end, uh, this all, everything is based on the relation of trivets and the grid, small trivets, abstraction to small trees. And finally, also there is a, the, the very similar ideas from the, basement, uh, but the, uh, for, for, from the base for quite general meta theorems for kernelizations, also on planar graphs and graphs of bounded genus. So, so what I was explaining today, it just again, it's a very small uh, part of the whole uh, area, what's happening with the trivets and by dimensionality, grid theorem, so there are really a lot of uh, interesting algorithmic applications here, and not only in parameterized complexity. Again, so if you are interested to learn more, you definitely have to go to chapter seven. So this is, uh, it it's, uh, explains uh, on a much deeper level what I was uh, talking uh, today and, and yesterday. And also chapter seven, it uh, contains a lot of uh, references to Further reading, so that's uh, definitely, if you want to go to, to learn more about trivets, please go there. And if you know about trivets, and if you even want to learn about uh, even more, then I would strongly recommend to take a look at the book. Uh, this is the book which was uh, uh, published to celebrate the 60th birthday of Hans Badlander. And these books contains uh, the surveys, which are really at the age uh, of what's happening now about trivets, kernels, and algorithms. So, and this is a really a nice collection of surveys on quite advanced topics. And trivets is again one of the main hero of this book as well. Yes. So I am done. And uh, yes. So if you have any questions, please shoot. Thank you so much for the talk, Fedor.